thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to the museum for hosting this project and this exhibition. We're really excited. Thanks, shout out to Sam back there who did an amazing install, realizing what we wanted, um, particularly about the quilt, uh, which was complex and we wanted it to hang in that space. Um, so thanks to everyone and thanks to all of you taking time out of your busy day, especially at this busy time of year. So we wanted to give a little bit of setup about Shake and Make, kind of what we do, what, how Shake and Make was born, and how this project emerged. So Shake and Make actually began in a snowstorm, that's our car, uh, around 2008, 2009, and we um, went on a mission uh, to a value village where we purchased a set of Betty Crocker recipe cards. So that's the genesis. And so some of our earliest work, um, well, first of all, Shake and Make embroidered patch um, is something uh, you'll see. So Shake and Make in general, we try to take crafts, objects, forms from popular culture from the 70s, from our context of growing up, and reinvigorate them and bring them into a fine art context. So, for example, I've always loved patches, so we had to have a patch, right? In the 70s, you all had patches you put on everything. Um, we do engage in a wide range of work, and it's also work that's uh, ancillary to our own individual practices. So what we want to do is kind of illuminate in this stage a little bit about our individual practices so that we can then move on to talking about the quilt in the space. Um, so one of the earliest bodies of work we did um, was to actually use the recipe cards as, um, as photo diptychs. And what we do with the recipe cards is we swap out part of the recipe and replace it with flash fiction that Claudia writes. Do you want to read this one Okay, here? so this story is, somehow your date had come to believe you were a good cook. She did not bother to consider how personal finances might affect your offering. Now she sat at the card table you'd borrowed from a neighbor. As she peered at her dish, you knew that it was only a matter of time before she discovered the emptiness inside. Uh, and then tuna chow mein casserole. It struck her as both odd and somehow right that whenever she made her mother's signature dish, it always tasted a little bitter. So you're getting kind of the themes of Claudia's writing, and uh, I do the Photoshop work, Claudia does the writing, we come together, and then the photo diptychs that are in the, in the um, other space for this, we kind of rebooted this, but in the context of COVID, so the stories are more resonant of COVID experience, and also Adriana has added the collaged elements, which are quilt form, or quilt form-esque, kind of brought to tie that together. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Claudia right now, and she's going to talk a little bit about her work as it intersects and comes into Shake and Make. Yeah, so um, that's me and something I made. Um, and she's wearing everything she made today, I, too. And I decided I'd wear things that I made. So I come to Shake and Make as an enthusiast. Um, and a skill collector. I've been knitting and sewing for, and writing for many years. And when we found those recipe cards, there was kind of a magic moment where we were just like, who would eat these? And what is going on with these pictures? Though so they were familiar of our They were familiar. Our, our there was, a, they there were was an uncanniness familiar. to them, let's say, <laughs> right? So yeah, I'm someone who likes to say yes. And this is an example of some of the detail. I went and did a workshop with um, Alabama Channon in Florence, Alabama, uh, to learn more about the reverse applique technique which we use subsequently on our felt banners and a piece for Supercrawl 2011, 2011. I think, um, called Containing Failure. So I'm really into failure. Uh, this is my tattoo. Um, uh, it comes from a Samuel Beckett quote, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. And this is a great kind of um, quote and overarching principle that I follow because um, failure is inevitable and you just keep trying again. Um, this is containing failure so we did these three plant um, covers for Supercrawl in 2011 and they demonstrate the reverse applique technique and um, some of our playfulness with forms and messages. I don't even need this. And this is a 
Charlie's Angels, everyone, not everyone, okay, <laughs> many of you anyone? may recognize <laughs> this, sorry, I say that now, but uh, reverse applique, search and destroy Charlie's Angels, we also had a search and destroy Kiss, the Destroyer album, and those are resonant of our sort of childhood uh, in churches where felt banners were really prevalent, right, you had those really exuberant felt banners, and we wanted to take some of our cultural uh, touchstones and merge it with that experience. Because we pray at the Church of Charlie's Angels. <laughs> we pray at the church. For sure. I pray at the Church of Craft. <laughs> the Church of Craft. Um, and then letterpress is something that I've always been interested in, and I've done a number of workshops using letterpress. And um, this side image is of a project that I started when we were doing a residency at the Larry Spring Museum in Fort Bragg, uh, California. And this is a chapbook of stories, flash fiction stories that I have written based on photographs from Larry Spring's uh, photo album. And finally, beer. Um, it's all about beer. And for what, so for <laughs> me, Shake and Make is an opportunity to bring the things that I'm interested in into an art concept and think about things in a conceptual way in a larger issue. And I wanted to learn how to brew beer. I learned how to brew beer. This was also part, this was like the first time that we had a community aspect to our work. In this case, we got people from the community to crochet the beer cozies. Uh, and so a number of people, there are 99 of these, and actually we have more because we had some other prototypes. But 99 bottles of beer on the wall, and all of those are hand crocheted beer cozies. Again, another invocation like childhood. Did you all like sing 99 bottles of, of beer, beer on the wall on these road trips, et cetera? So, kind of like invoking that childhood nostalgia and then reconfiguring it in a contemporary art context. Also, the beer was brewed to explode. We wanted it to explode. It never exploded. I'm too good. Hence, failure. She's too good at the beer. We couldn't make it explode. We had researched far and wide for people to help us. Many, Matt Walker, uh, local artists. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, tried to help us make the beer explode and it never exploded. I'm gonna take over from here and start uh, talking about some other shake and make work, but also how it's an extension of the work I do. People might know I teach photography and video, mostly a media artist, but shake and make has allowed for me to have a more material engagement, to um, undertake more nostalgic projects and to kind of reinvigorate the things um, of my youth and my old fascinations. Uh, so we created in 2017, so the beer sculpture is domestic brew 99 bottles of beer on the wall. This one is domestic brew craft beer garden. So we created a maquette of beer bottle caps and then we um, made a giant image. Too bad we don't have the story about how that went sideways and how I can thank Chris Meyer for uh, saving us by telling me about this place that does large format scanning. Um, and so my uh, work is really, it, and my photo-based work is marked by repetition, pattern making, um, and abstraction, which and are all say, kind of manifest this is here. my unseen labor of drinking. Yeah, because I don't drink. So um, 200, uh, two years of Claudia's drinking it's is not just me. I'm going to actually step back from that and say, it's not just me. Yeah, Claudia's dad's also a beer guy, and he certainly added some. The hilarious thing is Claudia doesn't like crappy beer, and we were trying to make a flower, and I had to go out and buy what was it, what kind of crappy Miller or something or other. It's like, you know, we couldn't even get, like, how many does it take in a flower? Six. A six of that. We had all these craft beer, but not enough of the crappy beer, and we needed it. We had, I had to go and actually buy that and gave it to workers. Um, again, following this kind of theme of nostalgia, when I was 10 years old in school, we were given cardboard cutouts of silhouettes of the three wise men, a box of noodles, and then the teacher spray painted them silver, and my mother still displays them to this day. <laughs> So Shake and Make allows me to kind of like go down memory lane, but with the mastery of kind of all these years of material engagement. So this is 30 by 40 inches. It's a whole other level of macaroni art. And um, it's also a reflection, it's called Master Chef Boyardee. So a lot of times we're playing on food cultures of the past and food cultures of the present, right? So we have this like foodie culture and master chef culture, and we're kind of giving that designation to Chef Boyardee. Um, some of my other work people uh, might be familiar with, again, Spirograph, something, um, 
again, a toy, but how can a toy go beyond? I was always frustrated as a kid. You get one design, what do you do with it? But as an adult, I can do multiple iterations and make patterns and kind of op art. So uh, called circular logic. And you can see they're like one disk, one hole, but kind of played out. Um, my interest in abstraction, I've always been very interested in abstraction, but a lot of people feel repelled or separate from abstraction. So I've had a long project of bringing storytelling, personal storytelling, concept, narrative into abstraction. This, I think, allows people a touchstone and a way to enter. Uh, so I'm showing this work here, Newman Good and Plenty, because the museum owns this work. I donated this work. Um, and I'm very happy to have my work in, uh, represented in the collection here. Um, and in this body of work called Comfort, I was reflecting on two ways that I comfort myself, which is through structure, order, pattern, and sweets indulgence, right? And I think of these as very gendered as well. So that exploration. And these are all direct references to color field paintings. So if we think about color field painting and we think about abstraction in the middle of the 20th century, it was usually devoid of content. And also another theme that's going to come up in Shake and Make is I like to play with high-low. So this is dime store candy elevated to large format color field painting-esque photographs. And then um, quickly, I also make puck paintings where the colloquial mark of a puck striking a surface becomes abstraction. Again, point of entry. Um, this is our shake and make <laughs> Venn diagram. <laughs> Because Shake and Make, not only do we bring in collaborators like Adriana for a particular work, but we also engage with community in different ways. Claudia already had mentioned um, about the getting um, other artists, other local crafters to create some of the uh, cozies. Take it away. All righty. So yes, um, that Venn diagram, and I like it. It's a, it's a. Our motto too is I don't know if you remember. So Shake and make comes from shake and bake, right? And the original commercial was, it's shake and bake, and we helped. And, because it was a southern commercial. Um, <laughs> and we actually put that on our patch, and we helped, right? So that was already starting to bring in the idea of collaboration. And we had a third member of shake and make at the very beginning, who went on to pursue a PhD. So, <laughs> and it took the art right out of him. It took the art right out of him. <laughs> so our biggest project, up to then was the Hand of Craft, um, which is a 15 by 15 foot English paper piece quilt top and these um, large vinyl cut images from a vintage handicraft book, right? And so this was really, we were playing with the high-low here especially because of the division of like, oh, is it craft, is it art, which is, you know, we can talk about that if you want to, but it's not that interesting. <laughs> um, for, yeah, so we're trying to break down that. To we're trying it. to break that down. Thank you. Thank you for that <laughs> cue. <laughs> but so we brought in community members to work on this piece. We actually held workshops where we taught people the technique. And in exchange for the teaching, we just asked them to leave what they had put together for us to integrate into the quilt top. So that labor is not just ours, but many unseen hands throughout, like not only in Hamilton, but also we did one in Sackville during the handmade assembly. Christine Quayle and her children. Christine Quayle and her children. Yep, Christine. we had a quilting bee at our house. Um, and so, and all of those people were thanked in um, the exhibit itself, which was originally at the Cotton Factory and later remounted uh, for a show that we had at UWAG. And really here we're talking about the invisible labor of both artists and women. Um, and bringing those two together was really powerful for us and, and the response to the work was great because people were able to come to it as just, you know, as quilters and crafters or as artists, right? And also being able to see what they do reflected in the final project there. And finally, we wanted to talk about, I know I said I like to make a lot of things, but there's a fetish around the handmade now, where there's this feeling like, oh, did you make your shoes? And if you didn't, there's a little disappointment, right? <laughs> so fetishizing the handmade, and that was one of the reasons why we had these large kind of domineering 
examples of hand work. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of a Wednesday, a Calgary-based artist, and she says, I sheared the sheep, I spun the wool, you know, like yes. this whole thing that you have to do everything. So we kind of want to push against the specter of that, and that's why these hands are so large. Uh, but this entire thing was hand sewn, um, and there's kind of a detail of it, uh, and hand sewn. And we really wanted to try to bridge in our work this gulf between a fine art and a craft community. So that's why we really wanted a range of people participating, buy in, and then to be able to be exhibited, you know, in an art context. So um, I'm going to say a few words. Adriana can't be here about. Ad's work. But Adriana's parents are here. Oh, Adriana's parents are here. There they are. I thought it was you and relatives. Yay! Maybe you're going to be doing a better job of, you know, <laughs> Do you come we're on texting up? with Ad while she's trying to teach and things like that. But um, Adriana's work uh, has been for a long time, and Carol made some great opening comments as well, um, about sheltering. And more recently, it's been located more in quilt making. But the particular quilt works that she does in collaboration with her partner, Ryan, are really uh, invocations of sound, but without any actual sound. So these kind of triangular forms are very reminiscent of sound waves. And some of the other installation elements are often speakers, old radios, uh, things that make noise, but they don't actually make noise. And also the, where's an image that shows the sound ballasting? Um, they often use, you know, the foam that has little triangular peaks? So they'll <coughs> use that either represented in the videos or represented elsewhere. So there's this real tension between um, something that absorbs sound and something that's expected to make sound. Um, and their beautiful, beautiful, stunning quilt works with um, embedded kind of electronics uh, that speak in dialogue. Uh, so they're just, and actually um, some of the work, and I think, I'm pretty sure this piece, it was hard to tell on the Art Gallery of Mississauga's website, are now on view. So there's a wonderful group show there uh, if you're interested in checking out more of Adriana's work. And so you can see she has a very deep engagement um, with, uh, quilt making with quilt forms. Um, and so she was a great compliment in, um, uh, and we're gonna talk more about like, where are my notes? Are we gonna talk about that now? We're we gonna talk about that later. I think we're gonna talk about that later. I'm gonna go to, oh yeah, we're gonna talk about the collaboration a bit later. Beautiful. Um, so I'm showing the slide of Kara Walker's Fons Americanus because in March of 2020, Claudia and I had flown for the weekend to London to see this artwork because it wasn't going to travel. So we're in London specifically to see this artwork when Trudeau calls everybody home. So it's kind of our segue to talking about the Fugue Project as a manifestation of our, um, of our pandemic experience. So let me check my notes, Claudia, because now I'm kind of losing the track. It's okay. Okay. Um, so some of the pandemic challenges we wanted to talk to before we move to the quilt, and we're going there shortly, um, is talking about how do you get, how do you actually continue to be an artist under lockdown, right? As I said in a, our, at our opening, artists are often responding to external stimuli. Creativity needs to be nurtured. Community, collaboration, conversation, dialogue, all really important to the creative process. And it was, you know, kind of a how do you make art at the end of the world kind of moment. And for us, one of the real relief for us being Ontarians is that we were able to go out east to our cottage in Nova Scotia. And Adriana is part of our, out communi our art community at Out East. I know she's in a different province than our cottage, but it's only an hour and a half away. Um, and so we were really looking um, uh, to... Um, you know, we were really looking to kind of process our feeling and experience, and we were in conversation, and uh, because of the whole bubble in the Atlantic provinces, Adriana was able to come out, and we were also able to go to Sackville. And that's really kind of what began with Fugue. Yeah, and I mean, anything? some of those conversations are like, are you feeling this too? Is this, are you 
How are you feeling about your art making? What are you working on? Is there a reason to be working on art right <laughs> yeah. now? Yeah. Also, How the fact that I just art? thought I was going to do way more work during the pandemic than I did, right? I suddenly had like ambitions. Yeah. Early on, we had ambition. We thought, oh, this is like one big artist residency. Yeah. It's our self-directed residency. The reality of our job and the weight of it kind of um, took over. So. Uh, rupture, slog, monotony, those were some of the things we were contending with, and conversations. And so the works in the other gallery, in the gallery where we're going to go in a minute, really were born out of us trying to both work through and reflect on our experience. Good. I think we've done a good job of keeping within our time limit, and we can now take a couple of minutes to regather around the quilt and, and allow them to reset up the camera. Okay? Thanks, guys. So continuing on this theme, um, well, you're going to continue on that theme. I'm going to talk about Fugue, which is the title of the show. Um, and the show emerged out of these conversations we were having during the pandemic. How do we capture, how do we manifest our experience, and how do we actually work through our experience? And so the Fugue title is an invocation of both the Fugue state, because I don't know about you, but I felt like I was walking around in a disassociated fog of a state for a very long time. Um, and uh, that resonated, we talked about that. And then also Fugue is a musical structure in three parts, uh, employing theme and variation. And I always have to give a nod, because if there's any musicologists in the room, they're going to skewer me, because it's a much more complicated musical form than that. But we're artists, and we borrow from whatever we want to borrow from, <laughs> and we take the part that's relevant. And for us, it was this, um, this notion of a multi-part structure, often a three-part structure, as a way to capture our individual and collective experience. Because we were all really kind of, at least for us, and we talked about this, dealing with our individual experience and then trying to connect to this larger collective experience. Claudia's going to expand on that theme. One of the things I remember <clears throat> when we first started talking about it, we were talking to someone who's not an artist uh, in Nova Scotia, and we were saying, yeah, we're going to work on this really big quilt project, and it's about you know, the manifestation of our feelings during you know, COVID. And she was like, that just sounds really depressing. Um, <laughs> and then we were like, OK, let's go. Um, <laughs> you know, just give me a challenge. So really, you know, as Liz said, you know, we're connecting both, there's an individuality to this as well as a collective experience, right? Not just through the sewing of it, but also, you know, we swapped fabric so that we could incorporate elements of each other's quilts into that quilt so that while there are some lines, there are, is overlap, right? And that's another way of how, I see it as a way of sort of reaching out for connection, right? And trying to bridge into someone else's experience. And, we did a lot over Zoom. I feel like Zoom helped us because we were able to meet with Adriana when we weren't in Nova Scotia, because this took a while, um, and sort of work out ideas and concepts and design elements as we were working on them on the fly. But we didn't really see each other's pieces. I mean, I saw Liz's because we're in the same studio. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, I would say, sort of, um, you know, traditionally communities would come together in a quilting bee kind of thing, which is what we did a bit with the hand of craft, where we gathered people. This was really about remote, and it really, I think, in its technique and its collaboration, exemplifies how we all had to pivot in various ways during the pandemic in order to continue our own practices, as well as maintain some sense of connection. Absolutely. Um, and so, Everything about this project is a metaphor for COVID. And before we go into talking about our each individual section, um, we wanted to kind of like throw out a bunch of these metaphors. And one of the things I want to kind of put first because of my longstanding interest in abstraction um, is that we've had a great experience like at the opening hearing people's different interpretations. And what, one of the things that, that I'm really happy about is that this piece, being abstract, is open for a lot of people to bring their own COVID story to it. And that's intentional. Um, so some of the themes uh, that we can talk about, and we'll just banter back and forth as they come to mind. But for me, it was just about a lot of it's kind of repetition. 
So making a quilt is a lot of repetitious labor. We endured a long period of time. The project took a long time, just as living under COVID took a long time and, um, and was laborious. And so that's one of the reasons that we, we hung it in such a way. Well, there's two reasons to hang it in such a way. We wanted it to be a weight. So a, a quilt is a domestic object that's supposed to be comforting. You embrace it, you feel better. We wanted it to also be heavy and smothering. Okay, and it's actually straining under its own weight. These sides are much lower than they started, and that's another metaphor for COVID because the weight of the quilt is causing the seams to give, and the whole thing, it's like a very incremental uh, living object, right? Because the object is changing over time from being in the environment. Yeah, and I'd say that, you know, a the theme that resonates here for me particularly is uncertainty, right? Uncertainty in duration. Right? How long can this go on? Right? And trying to, um, every time that you think that there is a break being met with, let's say, another barrier, you know, finding out ways to comfort oneself through pattern repetition and also sort of watching what's going on and, you know, being able to be okay with uncertainty. We're not really trained to be okay with uncertainty. Absolutely. And also kind of these themes of making do. Yeah. Right? You're just kind of like, what can we work with? What do we have to do? It's part of our experience. Um, we also want to bring in kind of a little bit of a, of a discussion of the diptychs because they track back into the early shake and make days, but there are much more, the stories were written specifically for this show. And we also selected all the cards that were ways with. So this theme of like making do and kind of like you know, just working on the fly. We just thought it was hilarious that there were several uh, recipe cards in the, in the set that we still have and go back to to mine for new opportunities um, that were like ways with, ways with fish sticks. And it's both disgusting and pathetic uh, and it's sort of like ways with, but right, that's what you were doing. You were taking and just using what you could use. We were gonna have a sourdough starter here, right? Because everybody <laughs> yeah, right. made sourdough. <laughs> We They're thought like, that would uh, be a nice uh, uh, aroma, uh, aroma in the space as well. And then, um, so there's stories, there's embedded flash fiction that, that speaks to some and, and manifests the feelings of COVID. And then again, looking for ways to collaborate but be individual at the same time as collective is I do the Photoshop, Claudia writes the stories, and we, um, uh, Claudia's, I mean, uh, Adriana's partner, Ryan, I sent the digital files, he printed them out, Ad did the collaging elements, um, looking to kind of tie the quilt pieces onto there so they're quilt forms that are actually put over the photos. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else that needs to be said about that? Mm. Um, okay. And also, this was a point Adriana made, um, <laughs> was about trying to make something beautiful out of bits and pieces and scraps, which is important there as well. Okay, I can talk about my piece? Okay, so this section is my piece um, because anybody who knows my other work knows I'm really into repetition, I'm into control, I'm into pattern. Um, I'm also a supreme masochist and very stubborn. So I decided to hand sew my entire piece, thousands of hours. So that's an important COVID metaphor, which is thousands of hours of tedium and nothing to show for it, right? So that's kind of here. And I also really like this idea because I am always trying to control things and keep them of it kind of glitching. And I've always kind of been interested in when we think of glitch art, we think of digital, right? Because that's where we get all that glitching. I like this idea of something super slow still glitching, right? This is like the, the analog version of glitching. And it was also inspired for anybody who's a film, uh, a film buff by Chantal Ackerman's Jean Dielman. So this is a French film from the 70s. See, Mary O'Connor's nodding, yeah. Because it's all about kind of control and what you start of noticing with the main character is that all the ways that she's really like controlled her environment start breaking down. And that's how you see her psychological state breaking down. Um, what's also really, to me, artwork is also about life lessons. I learned a lot of life lessons here. Uh, one of them is that you can't go it alone. And at a certain point, I couldn't even finish the quilt myself. Um, it was just too much sewing and no time. And I actually hired a friend who's a textile artist, Karen Thiessen, uh, and she sewed some of the rows together. 
And then the other thing is back to the theme of failure. I still walk around in shame. We were all to make a six by six foot section. And I misdid the math and mine is like, sure, it's six feet across. But because of the way the pattern is staggered, it's like five and a quarter. And I was just like for weeks walking around in a shame spiral. I know, I didn't want to say anything. I was kind of like, your piece looks a little shorter, but I'm not going to ask you to do more work. It's so like it's you fun. can't do any more work. So, but I've chosen to embrace this Fail as better. it is part of the process, right? Um, so I think that's sufficient. Why don't that we? is sufficient. Okay. Yes, it's good. Um, yeah, so I took a very different approach to my section. Um, my se I work more intuitively. I really just, this was the first section I did, this stripey piece. I was like, okay, we're just going to do these crazy stripes. And from that, I would just build stripes. I was like, okay, they got to be six feet long. That was really my one, and then they had to use these fabrics. This was a really interesting process for me because there was a certain point where I lacked faith in this section. I was like, ugh. <laughs> Literally. And I was like, well, you can't, you know, you're in the middle of the quilt. You can't quit. So I kept working on it and, you know, through the arrangement, I actually found a way to trust my voice as far as an artist and work intuitively. And by the end of it, I was quite pleased with it. I added the houses as a nod to sort of our lockdown and pandemic, these houses, but the houses kind of fuck up. Oh. Um, throughout and no children. what? No children in the room. Oh, okay, good. Uh, well, no. Okay, they're good. You guys are good. You've heard it before, I'm sure. Teenage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, I was just sort of playing with how I felt actually at different times when I was working on it, and I had these black stripes, and I really kind of had intended to embroider more. Um, so sometimes you'll see things like, you know. Uh, you know, I thought this would be over by now, um, those kind of little things. There were a hundred other things that I thought about, like, oh, I could do that tomorrow, like that idea of that sort of self-talk. And that was one of the elements I, had, I, I put into here, not quite as much, but like the pandemic, I ran out of time, <laughs> is what I'm going to say, right? I'm a deadline-driven woman. And that deadline came and I had to let it go. So. That is really how my piece came to be and express my experience, which really is, oh, and since we were going to have that reference, you would like me to. I want um, your literary reference. My literary well, reference is um, Janet Malcolm's essay, 41 False Starts, which is an essay about the artist David Sally, but it's a, an amazing, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it, and the whole essay is just all her attempts to start the essay. Um, and it gives you a complete picture of the artist by the end of it, as well as the writer. And those kinds of um, connections really resonate for me. Awesome. Um, since Ad can't be here, Adriana can't be here, she sent some words so I can speak about, uh, or I'm going to read. I'm not going to speak someone else's words. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make it up like I do with my own words. <laughs> okay. So uh, for years, Adriana has been exploring shelter and structures that provide safety. Her recent work with textiles tightly focuses that idea down to considering just one protective item that covers the quilt. Adriana's section of the quilt was constructing using no pre-planned pattern. She works in an intuitive way of making that is primarily improvisational. Her section was made by completing a bunch of smaller sections, then piecing them together in a way that references pathways. Each little chunk or section drew from what improv quilter Sherry Lynn Wood refers to as a score. In this case, a particular set of colors, stripes of a certain width, and a quarter circle. Adriana's section is a maze-like structure with no, where no pathway allows a clear path that moves through the design. There is no definitive direction. So in that way, it acts as a complement or antithetical moment to Lissa's more ordered section at the opposite end of the work. There is an order and a narrative, so we did talk and discuss about what the narrative arc was going to be of the quilt um, and how they would flow into each other. Um, and then somewhere in Ad's comments, and I misplaced them, she had talked about how some of our conversations were in the ocean and that she really kind of internalized. We talked about a color palette, but I hadn't really thought about the sky and the ocean and where we were when we were starting standing this in the project water. that we were standing in the water at the cottage. And I'm gonna leave it at that pleasant thing because that's kind of positive. That's a, yes. the happy space. Chris, hey guys. Um, I've been spending a lot of time looking at what's happening underneath the work. 
and thinking about it in relation to the uncertainty part of the dynamic. And I'm wondering if you can speak to, like this is something, I mean, you can kind of plan for, but you can't pre-visualize. So now that you've had a chance to look at it, I'm curious as to how not only what's happening on the floor with regard to light and shadow and gradients and all these kind of like porosity between form thing that's going on, but also just this charged space, you know, between the object and this hard architecture beneath it. So I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to look at that, think about it and fit that into the overall kind of scheme of things. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I'm happy to answer because we really were invested in the shadow, right? We knew that there would be a shadow and we wanted that to add to the heaviness. I had hoped, knowing that the fabrics were of different density, that light would shine through it. And what I'm noticing here, because I haven't spent this much time, is that the more time you spend in here, the more the understory develops, right? Because our eyes are acclimating and you can see so much more of the kind of window panes. It's like a shadow life of the object. So we really wanted it, and when we spoke with Sam about the install, we were like, yeah, we want it lit from above. We don't want the room very bright. The shadow's important. And we were just very happy that we were getting uh, all those kind of forms drafted there. And I like that you're talking about this kind of tension. And that's why I sort of talk about the, uh, the, what's happening over time, right? So that kind of compression is happening over time. But we really wanted it to be at a height where people could experience the top, but be encouraged to go down and look underneath at what's happening. Because there's all the business. There's all the work. So even like the labor quill, we purposely, we never, these are called quilt tops, because we never actually do the quilting part. We never hide the work. We leave the work out. We leave the, the mess, which is underneath it. Um, available and accessible. Did I answer all three parts of your question? Yeah, absolutely. I'm okay. just thinking though, like it, it's breached in certain places, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like this attempt to kind of like completely control or shelter, yet it's porous. Yeah. You know, which I think connects to a lot of, of some of the other things that you guys are talking about on that sort of like uncertainty end of things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Other questions? Comments? Dances? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Katie. Well, thank you so much for this. Um, I'm fascinated by the, the role of structure and both the quilt and within the recipe um, over there, the recipes over there, and thinking about structure and the role of constraints in your work. So it seems like you know, you're talking about how you each started off working on six foot sections of the quilt within the recipes and thinking about like the kind of constraints that go in there and kind of writing a story during a recipe format. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of constraints in your work and, and how you work with constraints and if that's something that you like to work with that, that helps like, spark ideas for you. Um, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I'm actually um, working a lot with constraint right now. I took a workshop um, about Nubian writing. If you are familiar with that, it's a, it is all about constraint, right? And doing things like, oh, write a novel without using the letter E, right? Or use a certain pattern to affect, you know, how you communicate the words, right? So for me, actually, I love looking at pictures and coming up with stories. That's one of the, like, that's in the diptychs. It's in the chat book that I'm working on with the Larry Spring Museum. So for me, constraints are actually uh, a, a way to be free, right? It gives me a little bit of a border to balance against and then to see how I can actually improvise and do what I want to do within those constraints. And I feel like constraints as a theme for the pandemic really came into play here. I mean, we were constrained by colors, right? What color, we had a color palette that we wanted to use. We had techniques. Liz was the only one who hand pieced her section. Ad and I were like, okay. Um, <laughs> they also know how to use a sewing machine. They are also much more skilled textile artists than I am. This is like my second major textile piece. Mm -hmm. born from sewing patches on my jeans as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And now textiles will probably be elements in um, a lot of our, more of our work. We already have another project in mind. Yeah. Um, but that, I mean, I'm, that would be my sort of section on constraint, but if you want to add, but... 
No, I think similarly. I, and, I, and I like that it's another metaphor of the constraints of COVID. And I've kind of been trying to learn how to live under constraints. But in my artwork, because of this interest in pattern and repetition, and kind of a little bit of repetition compulsion, you know, the Freudian idea of like, <laughs> I, you know, and that's kind of what returning to these childhood forms. So, so sewing, hand sewing returns me to sewing patches on my jeans, uh, just like the candy in my work of, uh, uh, you know, all, all these kinds of things. And I think I tend to impose a lot of constraints and then try to flip the switch just a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Sort of like bringing in content that wasn't traditionally used. Um, but pattern and repetition and uh, is very comforting to me, right? So, so I, I like that. It gives me kind of stability. Uh, and I think that's kind of like, uh, it was actually, well, that brings it up. It was really hard for me to do this section, right? I didn't want to, I kept delaying when I was going to start glitching because I'm much more comfortable with a highly regularized pattern. Uh, and I knew I wanted to transition, but I just struggled with that, right? Because I had to like color outside of lines and I had to work more intuitively. Uh, and I had to let it go that I wasn't going to know what it looked like until much later. Whereas when you have something highly planned and patterned, it's predictable. You've created predictability. Yeah, and I also actually like to break constraints, so that's why I like to have them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I saw the quilt the first time together, <coughs> when my daughter uh, talked about it uh, previously, I was expecting to see clear lines between one quilt and the other. But I really liked the way you guys did it, the transition from one quilt to the other. And I think that you really did a great job on that one. Okay, thank you. It was a lot of fun, too, to figure out how we were going to do that, right? Um, you know, how things were going to bleed over and, um, you know, sort of integrate. Even though we had earlier, like, you know, some ads, teal is in mine. Claudia and I shared a lot of fabric because we're in the same studio. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we were drafting. And again, a, a little bit about that musical state, which is where you're picking up elements and using them in later parts of the song. So 